molecular intelligence and data visitation working group, um, I'd like to um, draw your attention to our code of conduct. Uh, we value your participation. We aim to create an enjoyable experience for all our workshop participants. Um, we ask you to please adhere to the RDA code of conduct. If you notice any violations during the workshop, um, please contact conduct at rd-alliance.org. Um, now I'd like to introduce my uh, colleague, Ilif. Ilif, uh, if you could say hello, and um, then we'll do a quick overview of the agenda and a, a warm-up question. Okay, thank you, Natalie. He hello, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Elif Ekmekci from Ankara, Turkey. Uh, I'm a medical doctor and a bioethicist, and I am the um, co-chair of Artificial Intelligence and Data Visitation uh, Working Group, together with Francis and Natalie and Claudia, who is not, I think, here uh, with the audience right now. So uh, I welcome everyone. Uh, I hope today we have a very fruitful uh, workshop. Um, so my task today will be um, to introduce you uh, the preliminary results of our survey, and then, um, of course, join the discussions together with you. I'm very happy to have you all here and uh, pass the floor to Natalie to introduce to Agenda. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you. Um, just uh, briefly, I would like to um, give you a overview of our recent work. Um, as Ilif mentioned, we have completed deployment of a survey related to current ethical, legal policy, and societal concerns related to generative AI. Our teams have prepared guidance on legal considerations for AI and DV, informed consent, ethics committees, and an overview of the various global, national, regional, state, and municipal AI bills of rights in, that are currently being implemented worldwide. Uh, my particular work has been on the AI Bill of Rights. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more in a moment. Um, but what I would like to invite you all to do now is to join me in a quick overview question. Um, I'd like to get your um, input on a... Um, brainstorm question. Um, in that question, I'm going to invite you to use a um, QR code and um, give us a quick uh, input from yourselves um, by joining ahaslides.com xw91h. Um, if someone could paste that in the chat, or I may be able to do it myself here, um, you'll notice it at the top of our notes document. Um, please go to AHA uh -huh Slides. And um, here, what we would like um, for you to do is share with us um, which aspects of AI policy you need to know more about in the next six to 12 months. This will help us gauge some of the interest in the working group and um, some of your backgrounds as we enter our interactive conversations for the rest of the day. You should all be able to see um, some of the options that we've pre-populated here. And as we move through the day, you'll have opportunity to give us a little bit more uh, information throughout the workshop. We also have an interactive notes document. Um, I would like to invite you to join us in that notes document. You can use the link um, that you see in the chat and it should take you directly to um, the role of artificial intelligence in building responsible open science infrastructures. Um, if you scroll down, you'll see uh, information um, where we invite you to uh, include yourself in our roster of participants today. You'll see an overview of our agenda. 
And um, you'll notice that next up, we have Dr. Daniel Hook as our keynote address. And we will be um, very much looking forward to that talk. Then uh, we'll be having some panel discussion and an interactive discussion of all of us on today's call. Another panel, more interactive discussion, a brief summary and all your input today, um, especially if you include your ORCID here and your contact information, um, can help us to further the aims of the working group and create better deliverables for the global community. So really encourage uh, your participation today, both in the interactive notes document and um, in our interactive slides. We'll be sharing all this information with you throughout the day. Um, Ilip, do you have anything you'd like to add before uh, we move on to Daniel's talk? No, thank you, Natalie. That was great. Super. Um, so um, without uh, further ado, I'm going to introduce you to the section of the agenda um, where you can um, add your own notes and questions in the workshop, particularly if you will have questions for Daniel throughout his talk, feel free to add them here or in the chat. We'll make sure they're all addressed, even if there isn't time, we'll get back to everyone throughout the day. Um, so add your notes here, add your workshop questions, and uh, we value um, so much your um, input today and you taking time out of your busy day to uh, participate in this workshop. Um, I hope you will now um, welcome Dr. Daniel Hook, CEO of Digital Science, co-founder of Symplectic, research information management provider, and um, research uh, on Research Institute. Um, Daniel will um, help us set the stage for the day by discussing the profound impact of AI on open science. His talk highlights how AI technologies are reshaping data analysis, knowledge discovery, and collaboration in research, and the importance of integrating responsible AI practices to ensure ethical research outcomes. I'm going to stop my share. Welcome Daniel to the floor. Daniel, if you have slides, feel free to take over, share screen, and um, all of us will go on mute during Daniel's talk, uh, input our questions in the shared notes doc in the chat, and uh, we'll have ample time with Daniel before we move on um, to get uh, his responses to all our questions. Thank you so much, Daniel, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Natalie, and thank you for the invitation. Um, hopefully this is uh, something that will give you a little bit of perspective and grounding for uh, this, I think, super important topic. Where I wanted to start is really the observation that we are right at the beginning of what I call the exponential revolution. If you think about industrial revolutions that have happened in the past, they have... Um, gone from a period where technology has enabled a few individuals to periods where they've really displaced jobs and they've caused significant hardship in society. And if you look at this plot from a special report in The Economist from a few years ago, what it does is it plots some of the innovations that took place in history, technological innovations, and how long it took for those innovations to actually translate into significant changes in GDP. And you'll notice that there is a lag of about 30 or 40 years quite often between technological innovation taking place and uh, the change in GDP that then ensues following that technological innovation. Now, regardless whether you believe us to be in the fourth industrial revolution or the third or the fifth, depending on who you read, you will see different numbers applied to this. What you might think is that we are going to go through a revolution that is similar to other revolutions that have gone in the past. But this revolution is actually quantitatively and qualitatively different from its predecessors. 
it is a revolution in which the tools that we are creating are the subtlest and most powerful tools that we have ever created as a species. They are tools which are in and of themselves capable of designing their progeny. And so this is why I call it the exponential revolution, because this is the first time in history where we're coming to a level of technology, where the technologies we are creating are technologies that won't merely aid humans in creating the next technology, they may create the next technology themselves. And this is going to have profound implications for us from both a social perspective and a technological perspective. And so really that's the background to the comments that I want to make today. It is, it is all cast in that kind of vein and considering various different aspects of that world. About a decade ago, almost exactly a decade ago, one of my good friends, Jonathan Adams, wrote this wonderful piece in Nature that looked at the fourth age of research. And Jonathan argued that the fourth age of research was the coming of an age in research where international collaboration would become the norm. He was coming from a perspective where globalization was still in the ascendant. We hadn't gone into a more protectivist mode that I think most of us are experiencing right now. And he was arguing that the world's great research economies at the time were becoming more international and that he qualified the fourth age of research as the age in which international research became the main mode of collaboration. We'd gone previously through the third age of research, which in Jonathan's uh, characterization is national level of research, where you need access to national resources. The second age of research, which was needing resources on an institutional level, and the first age of research, which is basically the, the individual researcher doing research. And it's a compelling argument. It's one that I think really holds water over the last decade. If you look at all the metrics, we have seen increasing levels of international collaboration. But typically in the research world, things take a little while to filter through and to become uh, part of uh, how we experience it every day. So if we decided today to change research policy and make it very difficult to collaborate abroad, it would take several months for papers currently in train to be published. It would take several more months for people to start decoupling from their relationships, even if this was something uh, to be you know, done straight away. We see this with the Russia situation. Uh, Russia still has a significant amount of international collaboration going on. Um, it's less than it was. It's gradually waning, but it wasn't a complete, quick, sharp cutoff, even in face of what happened in 2022. So we are in this fourth age of research currently. And the question is, what does the fourth age of research really look like in practical terms? Well, I would argue that it's challenging to start making predictions because the fourth age of research that we're experiencing is based on 17th century technology. And by 17th century technology, I mean papers, publications, books. The way we communicate our research is based on a technology of 400 years ago almost. And there are positives and negatives associated with that. The negative associated with it is that the container that we have to communicate our research no longer contains the things that we're producing. And that's creating great stress in the system. It is, I would say, the fundamental issue that we have around talent retention and talent development in the field. It's the difficulty that we have for people who are able to progress in their careers. But it's also the challenge that we have with data as a whole. How do we communicate data? How do we handle data? And so the fourth age of, the res of research at one level 
is this movement towards having the technology available to us that allows us to handle the outputs of research that we are creating. Over the last 40 years, I would argue that fundamentally the character of research has changed, as has changed as data has become more prevalent, not just in the STEM fields, the science, technology, engineering and medicine fields, but also in fields like history and fields like music. The technology that has become available has significantly changed the picture. And whereas previously the outputs of our research could easily fit within the context of a paper, that's no longer the case. We also have videos, we have audio, we have software specific files, we have all sorts of things. And this will fundamentally change the nature of what research communication is. The challenge with that is that we have all sorts of institutions and cultural norms built around the publication as it currently exists. And what that means is that we're in a vulnerable period. While, when there's flux in the system, we are open to attack, let's say. And so a lot of the things that we need to think about between the interaction of data, the interactions of technology, how we build infrastructure are really important right now, right at this stage, because these are the norms that we will form that will protect future generations from all the downsides that you will have associated with the technology that we're being forced to interact with in order to contain the results of our research. AI will superheat the situation. AI will change how we uh, interact with each other. They will change how we interact with the data that we're working on. And I think most importantly, AI will change the way in which um, we are able to communicate with each other and with machines. Right now, all the publications that we write are written for humans, basically. A lot of the work that we do at Digital Science is in working out how to basically backfit machine readability into a publication. And that is something where AI helps us significantly. But I think in the future, the question may become, who are publications written for? Are they written for humans to consume or are they written for machines to consume? And these are some of the big issues, I think, in the space. This is also a different revolution for research because it's the first revolution where research itself is likely to be disrupted. Normally, research is the method by which we reach a revolution. It is the input material whereby someone comes up with a clever idea, someone translates that into a technological advantage, and we are able to uh, use that to change the level of productivity of society. This revolution is the first revolution where research will kind of have the revolution done to it. If you read the work of people like Benedict Frey, then you'll realize that there are two main uh, kind of streams of, of revolution in industrial terms. There's augmentative revolution and there's disruptive revolution. So broadly speaking, this is uh, a disruptive revolution is one in which one loses one's job and an augmentative res revolution is one in which one's job is augmented or one's capability is augmented. And we're currently at that phase with things like LLMs, large language models and AI, where we've been augmented. But we're about to enter a phase where we're going to be disrupted. And this is something that I think we've seen in the news, we've seen in the papers. And understanding how that disruption is going to happen, I think, is going to be critical to us. I very specifically chose this uh, this picture here of the tale of two cities, because the tale of two cities is actually the story not only of a technological disruption, but also of a societal disruption. And I think for research, we're going to see that technological disruption, but we're also going to see that societal disruption with our in our own research society. At the same time, we are going to see massive disruptions in society around us. I think the wealth gap will um, become 
much more extreme for certain parts of society and certain parts of the world, and that will drive certain specific behaviours. And we will, may also see an analogue in the research world itself. Um, so, yes. Technology, I would say, is something that is uh, most people focus on. And they say most technology is actually difficult to do. Having been a technologist for more than 20 years now, I would say technology is it it's, has its challenges, of course, and you have to think about it. But technology is easy. Culture is hard. Making cultural change is the tough thing that we're going to go through in the next few years. Um, the thing to build in, however, is deep thinking about how we build the technological solutions that we are thinking of and what are the implications. I'm absolutely convinced that as bad as some people will think that Mark Zuckerberg is, when he uh, created Facebook in the late 90s, he wasn't intending to undermine democracy. But because the platform wasn't thought about carefully, because the infrastructure wasn't put in place in a good way, the outcome of Facebook has been to undermine democracy in various parts of the world. And this is what I'm talking about when I'm saying technology is easy. Creating Facebook was not difficult technologically. Changing the culture around Facebook and working out how people are going to use that technology, that's what's difficult. And so it's fascinating and really heartening that you have a group of uh, intelligent, sensitive individuals here today thinking about these issues because working out where the stress points are in our science infrastructure, are going it, it, that's going to be an absolutely critical route to understanding how we should be careful and where we should put the guide rails in place. I think we also need to think about who we're building that infrastructure for. As I indicated earlier, are we going to be building infrastructure for humans? Or are we going to be building infrastructure for machines? We know that machines are a lot better than we are at certain specific things, and I'll come to this in a minute. But understanding how they need to engage with the infrastructure and how naive they might be with what we create, I think, is a really important point. I do think there's a role for humans going forward in this research conversation, and that means building infrastructure that ensures human centricity. The reason London is one of the world's financial capitals still is because it originally set up a lot of the rules by which the world's financial systems run by. There's no actual reason that London retains its uh, place really other than that. So you can tell that by putting the right infrastructure in place, you actually are able to tip the balance in your favour in interesting ways. And finally, we need to try and put ourselves in a position where we can equip ourselves to understand this world, understand the research that is being put out, regardless whether it's being done by an AI or it's done, being done by a human. So we need to remove the, the closed box around the research that is going to happen in the next few years. Big topic at the end, just to, to, to say, how do ethics look in an AI world? This is a this is going to be an ongoing theme for the next few years. And it's something where I'm very interested in uh, developing more capability at digital science. Ethics is something that we need to look more into in, in much more detail. Just a few quick final points. Uh, we're not as far along as people think. It is important to understand that AIs right now are leveraging their capability as pattern matchers. We, until recently, were the best pattern matchers on the planet, but AIs are very impressive to us because they have the reverse capability. They can pour data into any format you like. So if you want a, your uh, weekly shopping bill formed into a Shakespeare sonnet and you have access to chat GPT, you can do that. It's difficult for us to do. It's easy for a computer to do because it understands the patterns. But that's not intelligence. That's just a capability we don't have. And so I think that's important to, to realize. On the other hand, 
we do have, sorry, we do have deficits that computers don't have in that we have challenges perceiving multiple patterns. So we can't keep so many things in our head simultaneously. Most humans can keep around three things in their head simultaneously. Good people can do five. Exceptional people can do seven. A computer can hold many things in its head simultaneously. And that's where they become augmentative to us. So there are real benefits here and there are real dangers in terms of jobs and things like this. But this is just gives you an idea. I, I think people catastrophize and actually we are still in that tools mode quite often. Just quickly thinking about the future, I think what will happen is that we're going to be currently in a period of augmentation or extension. We're then going to go through a period of disruption. And the question is, can we put the right regulation in place? So if we think about the extension phase, the concerns that I would have would be really things like fake research, injection attacks, if you will, into the scholarly record, people trying to put things into the scholarly record that shouldn't be there. I see challenges with trust. I see decreasing efficiency in the system if we can't trust each other because we don't know what's real. If the public don't trust the research system, then why should they fund what we're doing? So I think there are challenges there. I also see fragmentation in the research world, challenges around um, whether we're able to continue to work with AIs in different parts of the world, because I think AIs will take on certain national characteristics. I think we're then going to have a disruption phase where I think fewer people are going to understand what's happening in the box. And I think if you're one of the people who does understand what's happening in the box, it will give you an unfair advantage and you will see an academic wealthy uh, part, of, part of society and you will see an academic poor part of our research society. And I think that's a real danger because I think it limits diversity and I think it limits diverse thinking. And I think this is super damaging potentially for our world. So why do we need regulation? Because of all the reasons I've just given you, I think infrastructure can provide those guide rails we need. I think um, ethical frameworks can be built into that structure. And it's something that we need to do now while we still can. And I think we need to remain connected and we need to remain part of this conversation. So with open science and AI, just to close, I would say, you know, open science powers AI and open science is powered by AI. There are going to be two uh, parts of this, uh, this relationship. And so I do think we have the ability to craft things to some extent. I think infrastructures are amazingly powerful tools for guiding the future. We saw that with the quick London example I gave you. If you think about a research paper and your interactions with a research paper, how many things do you instinctively know about a research paper just because you were brought up with it? There's an opportunity to do that in the AI space as well. When I was a PhD student, my supervisor said to me, you put your work on the archive, then you submit it to the publisher. And so when I started working more broadly in research and people didn't do that, I thought it was completely strange. That had been built into me as a PhD student. And I think with AI, we have the opportunity to get people young and train them in a certain way of doing things. And I think this is incredibly important for the future. Infrastructure, lots of people think of as technological. Infrastructure is absolutely cultural. The norms that I was taught as a PhD student are tremendously important for me and how I perceive the world and the world of researchers. And there's an opportunity to make people into the researchers we need them to be and to, for them to access AI in the way that we need them to access it. So training and education is a super important part of this. And just to finish again, I just emphasize the point, Ethical principles should be built into our infrastructures. It's not optional. It's not a light touch thing that comes at the end. It's the thing that comes at the beginning. And with that, I will close. I'm a little bit over. I'm terribly sorry. But hopefully this sets the scene for you in a good way.
Thank you, Daniel. That was a terrific talk. We really appreciate you setting the stage for us today. Um, for everyone who um, is with us and enjoyed the talk, I encourage you to add your questions in the chat in the uh, shared notes document. Um, you'll see a space uh, for questions. And um, if we might take one or two questions verbally now um, from the chat, um, feel free to uh, insert those now. Otherwise, um, we'll be moving on in just a minute with ILIF and the panel discussion on AI actions for sustainable development. Um, any brief questions now for Daniel? It looks like those will be async in the notes, Daniel. So um, get your typing uh, hands ready. Um, thank you for a terrific talk. Um, next, we'll be um, discussing uh, with um, ILIF uh, our panel discussion. We have many terrific questions. Um, Francis, are you free to moderate our panel? I, I'm free to moderate the panel. Yes, thank you. Terrific. That would be great. Um, if you could introduce our um, other panelists who are with us today, um, that will help kick us off. Thanks. Thank you. Um, firstly, I want to apologize to everyone because um, actually we had 340 registrations, but apparently my Zoom limit was 100 persons. So we we... So I apologize to people because people were turned away. I didn't realize it. So I just had to add a credit card and update my my account. And now people can get in. But I think we lost some people. So my apologies to everyone who worked so hard on this and especially to the people who couldn't get here. And I want to really thank Dr. Hook for a fantastic, really good opening that sets the scene and gives us a framework within which to, to think about things. Um, Professor uh, Alif, uh, many of you know, she is the head of the History of Medicine and Ethics Department. She's also the Deputy Dean at the School of Medicine and head of the Institutional Review Board at Tobe University of Economics and Technology. She's the co-chair of our EOS Future and AI uh, DV Working Group, together with uh, Natalie Myers, who's Professor of Practice at the Lucy Family Institute for Data and Society, the University of Notre Dame in uh, the U.S. Um, and she's also putting together, together with uh, Elif, in fact, a co-data working group on the role of integrity in data, AI, science, ethics, and policy. So eventually be hearing more about that. Um, Dr. Nana Barreste um, was one of the people we locked out Dr. Nana, very sorry. I hope you're in now. Um, but he is fantastic. He's um, down under at the moment. Anyway, he's in Melbourne. He's uh, responsible for artificial intelligence and research um, data at the University of Technology uh, and with the Australian Research uh, Data Columns, ARDC. Um, Mr. Lewis Jacob uh, Latana. Uh, he was, um, has been, is a research fellow with our Artificial Intelligence and Data Visitation Working Group. He's a Defense Research Officer for Cognitive Intelligence and Artificial Intelligence uh, in the Philippines. Uh, he asked the most provocative, the most difficult questions, but um, he not only asked the questions, he goes on to respond to them in the most innovative and creative ways. And... Um, my hero, my personal hero, is Professor Valeria Sokol Sheik. She is with the Belarusian Medical Academy of Postgraduate Education in Minsk. Um, she, together with others, have been leading on the topic of the role of AI with regard to ethics committees. We're going to have, um, I think, uh, probably a very short panel um, invitation or um, presentations, and then uh, we will have discussion here. So I will go to... Um, my good friend and colleague, uh, Professor Alif. 
Thank you, Francis. And also thank you for um, saving the meeting in the background. You know, you have been our hero today. So, um, I mean, in this panel, my job is easy because I'm just going to um, present the first uh, preliminary results of the survey on AI and ethical and legal implications of LLM. So I may share my screen. I think. So do I see the presentation? Do you see the presentation now? Yes, we do. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. So um, as I said, this is the preliminary results because this survey was the first deliverable of the AIDD working group. Um, and um, it, it, the survey has been developed by the AI and the, the AI DV uh, working group. As AI is a rapidly advancing technology with the potential to transform many aspects of our society, including education, science, and open science, and especially with the introduce, introduce of the LLMs and uh, generative AI, uh, more specifically, new avenues for research and sharing of information has been uh, open. So um, also AI, we all know that AI and more specifically uh, generative AI uh, poses new challenges to society, including uh, the, in the areas of human rights, ethics, law, research, and scientific publishing. So the aim of this research is to gather insights from scientists, educators, and members of ethics committees on the potential benefits and risks and or challenges regarding the use of AI and help uh, in the development of global approaches to legal frameworks, informed consent, ethical review process, and rights in the context of AI. Um, the methodology that we followed can be summarized by participatory bioethics. Uh, I think this methodology fits very well with the, with the questions that we're um, trying to um, think on uh, because participatory a participatory bioethics approach involves multiple stakeholders and interested partners throughout the entire research pro process, uh, starting from sh shaping the research ideas and questions, and to um, I mean going to um, analyzing the results and drawing out um, conclusions. Uh, the why uh, is that important? Because various interest and contextual requirements, as well as the type of impact different uh, uh, participants uh, envision are embedded into the research questions and also, as I said, in, in the conclusions uh, that we draw from the research. And the central ethical commitment of this approach is fostering reflection and open dialogue, which we mean inclusivity and the joint creation of knowledge rather than adhering to a specific ethical framework. I think this fits very well with the, with the ethical questions of AI and generative AI more specifically, as Dr. Hook said in his um, great presentation, we are dealing with a new uh, type of um, innovation with high radical uh, innovation capacity and high dissemination capacity that is influencing many aspects of our academic and social life. So we need a participatory approach uh, when we are trying to um, understand and also regulate uh, the ethical issues in this. So this survey, as I said, has been developed by the AIDV Working Group. And um, Francis was the hero behind uh, most of the questions and especially in structuring the survey. And also we got input from all AIDV Working Group members on the questions. Nana was also very effective uh, in helping us with um, uh, you know, um, drawing out the survey questions. And then after we um, prepared the survey questions, we decided to run a preliminary um, survey in Turkey um, to see how the survey works. And um, for that, we also follow the participatory um, approach. And we have a Turkish, we gathered a Turkish research team. Um, as you see here, it is quite, uh, it's coming, I mean, people are coming from uh, quite various backgrounds. Uh, Professor Erolo is from uh, biomedical e uh, engineering. Professor Dermanji is from law. Um, uh, Dr. Akshun is from biochemistry. Dr. Brooke from bioethics. 
And we have Dr. Akar from Political Sciences and uh, Dr. Anthony from Humanities. And when they, um, you know, looked at the survey questions, they of course had ideas and they wanted to change some questions or edit some other questions so that we reached our final survey um, questions. So just a very, um, you know, quick uh, glimpse of what we have on, until now, because the survey is on for, uh, has been on for the last two months and it's going to be on for another month. And we are having new participants each and every day. So when I was preparing this presentation, I just took what, what was in there already. But of course, these uh, the results that I'm going to present here may change as we end the survey. Um, the um, very, very surprisingly, um, there were uh, there were in um, you know very um, equal uh, representation of gender. They, uh, I mean, it, it, it was like 50% um, male and female. And we had the academic uh, positions of, of participants as I present here. The first question was uh, about using ChatGPT as an education or research tool. And the majority here, the majority of answers is that um, saying that most of the participants are using a GPT um, as a tool for education of, uh, or research. And the second uh, one says that a tool for information source. And the third one here is about literature search. Probably it's going, it's, it's being used as a tool for literature search, search. and then as a translation tool and the um, least percentage is on uh, writing assistance. Um, when we asked about the risks and benefits that ChatGPT bring to education, um, the 42% of participants uh, think that it's a getaway to plagiarism and other forms of research dishonesty by students. Um, and also 31% of them think that it's available education tool for students to, lo to learn how to do research. Um, and the 27% um, think that contribute to, it, it contributes to um, students' learning and assist uh, students in research. When we asked about the benefits ChatGPT can bring the bring to science, um, there is a um, you know a majority here, like forty percent, who sees it as a valuable tool in terms of providing accessible uh, scientific opportunities. And another group thinks that it's a valuable tool for contributing to research in science and available data and knowledge integration for science. And only a very small uh, portion of the participants still uh, think that it's a valuable tool for writing science. And when we asked about the risks uh, ChatGPT can bring to science, we see that there is 61% uh, uh, thinking that it's, it would may lead to weakening of trustworthiness in science, diminish scientists' learning capabilities, and pose a threat to scientific credibility. And uh, the other answers uh, with dominance are undermining responsible scientific authorship and cause harm, and potentially create bias and discrimination in science, and contribute to a decline in academic standards in science. And then we asked about the effects of ChatGPT on development of open science. So as you can guess, the green ones are talking about the um, benefits and the red ones are talking about the risks. And the, um, and the most significant benefit um, articulated by the participants is that it will aid the progress of open science by improving knowledge sharing followed by uh, it will contribute to the advancement of open science by enhancing knowledge production. And the major risks uh, perceived by the participants are it will hinder open science by diminishing academics' intellectual property rights, and it will harm open science by diminishing the education of emerging scientists, uh, followed by the risk of undermining open science by weakening scientific credibility and um, harming open science by causing bias in research. And this bias uh, issue has been raised in other questions as well. So uh, we also asked about the um, ethical issues that ChatGPT raises. And um, as you see, the dominance here is on plagiarism or other forms of scientific fraud. 
uh, followed by decreased trust in science. As you know, we, we discuss very, uh, trust uh, very much in the context of AI and generative AI. So it is also here. Um, I mean, 50% of participants think that it's going to decrease uh, trust in science. And then um, the errors or bias in reporting facts, results, or conclusions, followed by bias in the presentation of scientific knowledge, discrimination or stigmatization against individuals or groups and or groups, and bias in political or social principles. So if you would like to make a quick summary here, um, there are some um, concerns about uh, plagiarism or other uh, forms of um, scientific fraud and also bias in, in various forms, bias and discrimination. Okay, the next question was about ChatGPT and other forms of AI or LLMs, uh, if they are a benefit or threat to society. Again, you see the uh, color codes here, uh, green and red ones. Uh, the benefits are um, highly in terms of advancing science and contributing scientific research. And the harms are very much um, clustered in terms of leading to information and disinformation, uh, hindering intellectual activity and problem solving, leading future generations to become overly uh, dependent on technology and artificial intelligence, and making it impossible to distinguish between human and AI thought and creativity. I think this is going to um, be even amplified uh, with the uh, with the increased uh, use of generative AI. And the risks and benefits to active, active citizenship, this was a question added by our colleague from political sciences. Uh, the question was, uh, what, what are the risks and benefits uh, of artificial intelligence and uh, LLMs to active citizenship? And the most articulated risk was it can replace uh, employees and shortcomings in information sharing. Um, and in terms of benefits, uh, enhancing government agencies, citizen services, and expediting government agencies, citizen services were, um, you know, um, um, uh, raised by the participants. And I guess this is my last slide. Um, we asked what kind of ethic, what kind of role does ethics have to play in terms of AI and LLM ethics? And um, sorry, just. So uh, most of the participants uh, said that uh, no restriction should there be uh, depending on geography or political belief or any other factor in terms of accessing AI technology or um, uh, AI and also generative AI technology. And then uh, there is the ethics committees should review the development of AI and LLMs. So uh, most of the participants uh, thought that ethics committees have a, a significant role in terms of reviewing the um, research proposals or um, development proposals um, of AI and LLMs. And then there is support, um, there was a huge support uh, within the participants to the Future of Life Institute, uh, Institute's call for a pause or, uh, of at least six months on the riskiest and most uh, resource inter intensive AI experiments. And uh, there was also a significant um, um, agreement in terms of ethics has a role to play in giving direction and governance of AI and LLM, and ethics committee members should, of course, receive training to, re to review proposals on AI and LLMs. And this is the end of my um, presentation. As I said, these are the preliminary results. So our aim is to, you know, um, run this survey in other countries um, in which we have uh, group members and have some kind of a descriptive um, snapshot of um, what uh, is, uh, how AI and LLMs are comprehended in terms of um, ethical issues and how we can regulate them. So that's all from me. Uh, thank you for your um, um, thank you for thank you for listening to me. Alif, thank you so much. 
And really, you are the one who has made this um, survey work for us because although yeah, quite a few of us worked on writing it and putting it together, you actually ran it. Um, you ran it in, I believe, the Turkish language as well. And you, you have really seen the value of it and responses to it. Um, Alif, um, when you step back and you look at this process, at this writing of the survey, what do you think the value of it is? Is it something that is, is, is helpful? And how is it helpful? Is it something that we can say is reliable? What are, you, what are your, let's say, um, very high level thoughts about it? Well, you know, um, what I, um, I mean, the first thing that I can say about um, the developing the survey within the Turkish team, uh, of course, we had a we had a great work with the AIDV working group, but of course, and also we worked with the Turkish team. Uh, I think this is the first time um, a, a, a group of academicians from various backgrounds came together to think about the ethical issues of AI and generative AI more specifically. So I think that uh, it raised some kind of excitement uh, among the um, Turkish research team. And they were really very keen to, uh, you know, uh, try to disseminate the survey um, to their um, uh, fellow uh, uh, academicians so that they can answer. And yesterday I was talking with um, the uh, professor from law, Professor Olgan Dermenji, and I um, said to him that, well, we need the participation of uh, people from law background. And he said, and he said that he was really very excited about it and he was trying to share it with all his uh, academic fellows. So uh, one of the, I think we, we already had a benefit from the survey that people started to think and they realized that uh, addressing the ethical issues posed by AI and uh, LLMs is an interdisciplinary um, problem. And we, we should have an interdisciplinary approach to, you know, find ways to solve those problems. And uh, regarding the reliability, well, I have doubts about it. Of course, there are some limitations for the survey. Uh, we are, as I said, the survey is still on. I mean, we are still collecting uh, results, but I believe we'll have uh, and we'll gain a momentum because this weekend I'll be in Istanbul in an international conference and I will, of course, uh, present uh, some of these uh, preliminary uh, results there and ask for the academicians there to join the survey. So it depends on the, on the, on the number of uh, participants. We saw that the completion rate uh, is a little bit low because uh, the survey is quite long. <laughs> as uh, some of the people here uh, already recognize. So we'll see, but I have seen a few comments in the chat, which made me very happy. Uh, we have some uh, opportunities to run the survey in, the, in different countries. And I think having a global perspective is more important than having a, a, a nation limited uh, perspective. But as I said, this is the first step. And we would be very happy to have collaborators from different countries and just um, we can translate it to the native language or we can just do it in English. Uh, it depends on the on the on the uh, I mean on, on our discussions, but I think as the number of participants uh, increase, we'll have more reliable data and have more uh, concrete uh, picture of how these issues are comprehended. Thanks. Thanks so much, Alif. Um, that's really good. And I, I think it is important that we try, you know, the people here, um, we have now the survey, we'll, we'll try to run it um, on different platforms and different languages and so forth. And uh, we see people are interested. So contact Alif or Natalie or contact myself and we'll get yourself, we'll get you organized with that. We'll get organized with it as well here. Um, I think um, we'll go uh, next to Nana. If, if it's okay, because Nana is in uh, Australia. Um, we've gotten a little bit behind with time. That's that's the way I am. That's my fault. So I apologize to people. But Nana, would you give us just um, five minutes or six minutes or so of, of your thoughts um, on, this, on this topic of AI and what we've been doing? Please, Nana. And Nana, I'm gonna yeah, yeah, yeah. got it. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, 
as um, so um, I wouldn't actually, uh, I'm happy to present, but in the interest of time, maybe I will just speak. And um, so as an AI professional um, who is working on, the, uh, on developing AI, but also as a researcher who has interest in um, the responsible AI uh, side of things, I would uh, I would add a couple of um, couple of my thoughts. On one hand, there is uh, the need to look at the whole life cycle of uh, AI development, and um, and it, it's not just the life cycle of um, data science, but AI development itself is a is a collection of multiple life cycles. It's about it's about formulating the problem that by itself is a life cycle of, of its own. And, and uh, all similarly managing the data and then developing the AI itself. And, uh, and then finally deploying and maintaining such an AI. So this is it's a lot, number of intersecting life cycles come into that. And each of the stages where there is a, there are life cycles like that, there is friction. And the friction always uh, poses risk. But, um, uh, but some of the, in, in my experience, some of the things that have helped in the past are um, taking a participatory and collaborative approach uh, with stakeholders, wider the group of stakeholders, better it is and uh, paying attention to the risk and the concerns um, that people would um, face. So it's just moving away from just the algorithmic part itself, but uh, more onto the socio-technical side of AI. And um, even so there are, um, there are challenges. And um, so some of the things are, there are a number of trade-offs that one has to make in developing the AI. Uh, that might include things like that, uh, developing as well as regulating or managing the AI as a socio-technical system as a whole. I mean, there is of course the innovation and regulation. I mean, less the regulation, more the opportunity to innovate. At the same time, you have autonomy versus control. But the one I would want to actually highlight uh, the privacy versus its bias. For example, for on one hand, we want to um, respect the privacy of people, and which means, of course, um, you don't want to share the data. Of course, people don't want to share the data; they can opt out. And but when this happens, that can also mean that it will introduce bias in the data set, and hence a bias in the model. So it is like you can't eat the cake and have it too. So there are a number of such uh, trade-offs in, in this. So one is a privacy versus bias, as I, as I mentioned, and uh, uh, accuracy versus fairness. Okay, if you just want the model to be just accurate, it may not necessarily be fair in the, in the, in the broader uh, uh, sense of the data sets. And the transparency versus security, et cetera. And um, so these are the biases that one has to contend with. And uh, it is a fragile process. It is, it's important to remember the AI development and management is a, in one way it is a fragile process in the sense, as I said, it can be um, driven by a, a sequence of life cycles and anyone that is broken could actually uh, uh, break the whole whole process. This is also where some of the things like open science is, um, is very useful. At least it makes it transparent. In the same way, in, the, in handling things like, um, uh, it, it, things like privacy versus um, uh, the bias or the AI performance, one could also look at the data visitation or uh, some of the techniques we explore including feder federated learning, where you actually take the model to, uh, to, to the data in different sites and then uh, learn it in the partial um, or in piecewise fashion and then put it together or resolve it. 
So in, in summary, what I would say is you could handle number of these things, but, but it is important not to do it in a piecemeal fashion. And uh, it's rather you have to think systemically, I mean, uh, as, as a systems. So, so you need to recognize that AI development is not just technology, it is a socio-technical systems, and it is a systems problem. And so you need to recognize the cyclic nature of number of subsystems, the number of interdependencies, and the path to value that can be fragile, and the number of points of interest. So it is, uh, so with that, um, I, will, I will actually um, stop my uh, talk and, uh, but but thank you Th thank you for the opportunity, and um, so um, I will just leave it with that. Um, em emphasis. You cannot overemphasize the importance of adopting a socio technical lens to the AI development. Anna, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. once again, I I think you really help us to frame and the discussion and to see the challenges. And um, I think the chat is going a bit crazy, a bit fast. Um, are there any immediate questions or anything, um, something directly for, for Nana right now? And, and you can open your microphone. You don't have to. Um, good. Um, Nana, let's let's come back to this discussion. We'll, we'll come back in a few sure. few minutes now. Let's just sure. go to Valeria. Valeria, could you say something for five minutes or something? However, you feel best doing it, um, with regard to maybe the role you see now for ethics committees, for IRBs, or research ethics committees, whatever we call them, and this idea of oversight and governance of of AI from an ethics perspective. Uh, within our society. So please, uh, Valeria. Oh, thank, thank you very much, Francis. Thank you all for having me. Uh, one minute, I will show you my presentation. Where is it? This one. My computer a little bit frozen. That's why, wait a minute. <laughs> Sorry, the speakers, we can only see her nose. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. So Valeria, if you want to lower your camera a little bit because oh, okay. we're missing your beautiful smile. I'm sorry. Oh, no. thank you. <laughs> thank you, of course. Of course, one minute. I can't. Oh, this is my presentation. Can you see? One minute. Yeah, we see you perfectly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Some, it's really something good. bad with my. Oh, okay, we, will I be here, okay? Yep, very good. Thank you. I, I need to, to discuss with you some, some questions, some notes of our working group. This is a working group of Deliverable the Fourth, Guidance for Ethic Committees Reviewing AI and DB. And I will... Uh, uh, talk to you in behalf of our working group, very interesting group, really international from USA, from Indonesia, from Turkey, and from Belarus. And I think our results maybe will be interesting for you. Uh, for example, we, we try to, to define, to determine maybe the uh, role of ethical committees in a modern situation, in situation of open science, and at the same time, situation with the rising of AI in scientific research. And uh, we think that uh, we have one very important and very useful tool in this sphere. We have ethical committees, ethical committees which are reviewing not only AI and DV, reviewing all research process to, to evaluate, to help, to consult, to, uh, to discuss the main problems of the research in this sphere. And um, 
minute I try to show you oh my cron and uh, uh, you see the the tasks of ethical committees much more wider that are only reviewing AI they need to protect human rights need to protect welfare dignity confidentiality human risks and also they need to control AI, control the open dialogue with society and control the community engagement in, in the research process. And uh, these ethical committees have some tools for this. For example, uh, their independent evaluation, their connection with the institutional secretariats, their um, they're connecting with public and media, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we need these ethical committees in all spheres of science. For example, in my country, we have these committees only in medical sphere, but their, their tasks, their, their aims are much more wider than only medical sphere and evaluating the medical projects. And I try to share with you some steps of our working group, how we prepare the draft of this recommendation of this guide. And firstly, I need to describe for you our first scheme or our picture. Uh, this is a picture of correlation, correlation between different principles, different values, different rules, ethical rules of scientific work, because we cannot uh, talk only about artificial intelligence because all these principles are closely connected with each other. And uh, you see the foundation of this scheme is uh, the principle are uh, the principles of bioethics, principles of surviving of our mankind, like autonomy, justice, non-maleficence, and beneficence. The main part uh, are the principles of research integrity, the principles of scientific work from Robert Merton, principles, first, uh, first principles, to research the Italian principles, uh, alliance principles, like openness, consensus, inclusive, you, you can see. Uh, himself and uh, also we need to add additional principles for research integrity additional principles of research with ai and dv data visitation and additional principles of individual research sphere for example uh, i'm working in medical sphere and i'm um, i um, i'm absolutely involved in medical research like uh, and uh, we have specific tools like informed consent, like uh, specific te technologies, ethical technologies to involve people into the research, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the top of this uh, scheme or of this picture, maybe, is the principles of open science. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I can't see my presentation. Uh, principles of open science is very uh, useful for us now because um, this is the um, presence of, of our of our current current science and uh, this is the principles of UNESCO document about the open science and on the left side you can see the additional principles which is closely connected with open science like uh, principles of community engagement, like uh, principles of uh, uh, working with the databases and uh, like, a, sorry, uh, like a principles of the dissemination of research results. The second step, uh, from the uh, correlation of all research principles, we need to go to our task, to our deliverable, to the ethical principles, of uh, researcher use, use uh, AI. And we, uh, we conducted pilot survey in Eastern Europe and Central Asia by Google Form. It was very little survey, pilot survey, uh, near 100 participants. 
And uh, uh, there were people who, who are involved in biomedical research and members of ethics committees. And you see, we, we had three blocks of this survey, general questions about the AI and the role of AI in their life and their work, questions about uh, um, the role of AI in biomedical research, and questions related to ethical committees. And the um, main results of this survey we tried to ask uh, people about the role of ethical committees in research. And uh, if uh, I try to be honest, uh, they don't mean that uh, ethical committees now have a very great role in their research and have a, and they can uh, consult and help them to realize their research. And what about ethical principles and attitude, uh, attitudes which are necessary to address uh, temporary research conducted with AI? Mostly they said you can see about safety, about do not harm or non maleficence also about precise definition of responsibility of AI, transparency of AI, trust and justice. And according to the survey, according to our literature review, according to our discussion about the main definitions, about the problem situation, we uh, try to, to define objective and subjective principles of uh, AI in, um, in research. Objective principles like safety and robustness, governability and accountability, explainability and transparency, and effectiveness. Effectiveness, especially uh, very, uh, very important for data visitation, I think, but not only for data visitation. And uh, these objective principles are the basis. You can see on this uh, picture, the, the foundation is uh, Again, the principles of bioethics, beneficial harm autonomy. Then we can speak about objective principles like safety, like governability, like explainability. And only then we can go to subjective principles. Subjective principles is very are very necessary for people because these principles are uh, connected with the emotional sphere, with our knowledge, with our own feelings about and uh, about AI, and with our trust, of course. Subjective principles are justice and trust, and we think that we we may in uh, ethical committees we may ask uh, the researcher. We may check the research according to realization of objective principles, and then we can see how these subjective principles were realized. And uh, the uh, the third step, has, the third level, is our draft, the draft of deliverable report, guidance for the committees, and if I. I tried to, sh to share with you the summary of our draft. We need to say about the building of multidisciplinary review committees in all spheres, in all research spheres. It's absolutely necessary for my mind. Also, we need to point uh, fifth, uh, fifth, uh, fifth item. Uh, we need to, to add experts for these ethical committees. Also, we need to develop criteria uh, that details potential risks and uh, uh, to develop targeted trainings to help identify risks of AI. Uh, you see, uh, our survey, many people uh, talked with us about these special trainings and uh, about the importance and necessity, necessity of, um, 
of making trainings and making special education for members of ethical committees. And uh, the last step of, uh, of the preparing of our draft, we uh, created uh, an appendix, appendix uh, with schemes uh, and uh, pictures, and also with uh, two, uh, two sorts of checklists for uh, research ethical committees members. You see, of course, a uh, uh, checklist is a technological document, of course. This is not uh, so interesting, but uh, I think sometimes uh, members of research committees need, uh, need a really questionary, questionary how to check how to evaluate, how to review the uh, research project, how to find, uh, find the connection between the main principles of scientific work or main principles of uh, working with AI and uh, their realization at practice. And also uh, we have a uh, and this appendix, uh, the short uh, survey questionnaire, uh, questionnaire about uh, the trust to artificial intelligence, to data visitation of our of our people who are who are involved in research research projects, involved to research team, and. Uh, of course, I need to say that we have only draft. This draft uh, needs to, to be improved, improved, and we need to, to, uh, to improve our mistakes in language and in facts and maybe in our pictures. That's why we need some time but we have a good good team and i think it uh, will be done the best way thank you for your attention and here you can see my mail and if you have remote questions please uh, uh, don't hesitate to write me thank you very much for your attention valeria thank you so much this is Really excellent. Um, put, please put your email, if you want, into the chat too, so that people can have some time to copy it or so. I will. Um, yeah, it's really important. Valeria and her team within our uh, artificial intelligence and data visitation working group has have done an enormous amount of work on looking at the role of ethics committees with regard to AI. They have a deliverable. Uh, a publication that's coming out on it, and we'll be doing much more. I think it's a big topic, a topic we need to discuss. Get in touch with Valeria if you want. By the way, um, anybody can join the working group. You just join RDA. It's all free, and then you can join the working group. Uh, we have a lot of work ahead, as you can see, and we're really happy to try to share the load, um, share the suffering, share the pain with you, but also share the enjoyment of doing it together. So. Thanks so much right now. I'll go to Natalie now. Um, and Natalie has been looking really at a global overview of um, human rights with regard to um, artificial intelligence and also how this is being turned into, let's say, bills of rights in different places around the world. Also, Natalie, very importantly, and she'll have to do this, um, she's put together um, a Zotero um, bibliography list of references on AI um, as related to our work. Um, she'll throw that, I think, in the chat at a certain point. And that's also something that um, you can all contribute to, but also something you can all take from it as well. Natalie, over to you. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, everyone. Um, we've compressed our agenda a little bit. Um, I know we're running a tiny bit behind, um, but you'll notice that we'll move forward next to our session with Lily. I'm going to be succinct so that we have plenty of time for that. I've posted the link to my slides in the chat, a link to a shared Zotero library, and we'll give you a brief overview of the work of the um, 
team that has been actively uh, working on the AI Bill of Rights. I'd like to thank Eiuchi Azibo, Shiny Martis, Ronit Piranen, and Yi Yang Su. They've been a terrific group to work with. Our mission has been to produce an AI Bill of Rights communique for the EOSC Future Project, as well as uh, to the Research Data Alliance membership, promoting fundamental human rights and advancing trust in AI and federated systems for open science. We hold as important tenets of our work on this uh, effort that um, adoption of AI bills of rights and policies within member organizations can create mutual trust and benefits for all, and that attention to AI governance can improve the longevity and relevance of research environments and communities. Our working group deliverables um, include that report to AI's future at the top and our AI Bill of Rights recommendations and guidelines for the Research Data Alliance membership. Those are being circulated in draft form right now, and I've included a link to that draft for you to contribute to the review. Um, on the left side of this slide, you'll see a link to a shared library that includes a literature review of emerging jurisdictional and special interest AI rights and protections along with um, some other categorizations. Um, what we see in the literature and in the activities surrounding adoption of AI Bill of Rights at national, international, regional, municipal, and state levels are um, many similarities, which you can see featured here at the right in the matrix of rights and protections. And we also see some disciplinary and niche uh, bills of rights that are particular to certain membership organizations, certain professions, and certain uh, organizational types like educational institutions. Our uh, review of emerging jurisdictional and special interest rights and protections is categorized by jurisdictional rights declarations and acts, uh, special interest rights and protections, education, how AI is being used in education, and how students and professors are using AI in the classroom, um, healthcare and medicine, including digital twins, legal, policy surveillance, generative AI and its relationship to governance in publishing, authorship, and copyright, as well as some related news stories, attention to risk and compliance, and uh, where possible in alignment with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We have examples from many countries, and I hope they will be useful to you in comparing and contrasting the bills of rights you operate under or your models operate under with those of the countries in which others' data may come from, where other model deployers may be, or where other laws may govern the kind of data you can use in your training data sets. We have examples from Australia. We have some essential elements of responsible AI that we are promoting. We have a attention to impact assessment and encourage all members of RDA and EASC Future to include impact assessment in the way they govern their AI and they govern the way AI runs on their systems. And we encourage attention to AI alignment, a safety research process that aims to ensure that AI systems achieve desired outcomes. What we recommend is that if you're creating or implementing an AI or AI policy, you need to be able to define the system or policy's desired outcomes, articulate how you'll document the processes for monitoring, measuring and logging where you achieve and fall short of achieving the desired outcomes of your AI or AI policy, and that any group creating or implementing an AI or AI policy should consider auditable detection for bias, auditable detection for privacy violations, and have a clear control and escalation process. What we've discovered overall in the lit review and in the way that these emerging policies are being adopted and being tested is that AI governance can be approached from a human rights, risk-based or safety-based motivation or a combination of all three. Um, we're seeing a preponderance of 
risk-based regulation, and we'd like to encourage, particularly um, in the context of responsible AI, the prioritization of questions regarding the essence of being human, our relationship with AI and with one another in the future. Um, we have um, an overview here of OECD guidelines, global partnership on artificial intelligence, UNESCO recommendations and more, national AI strategies and more, and then by country and region. I encourage you to take a look at those and to take a look at our uh, draft deliverable and to um, pay attention to how awareness of the risks and acknowledgement of our role in perpetuating or minimizing them can help us work together to protect against harmful outcomes and ensure that AI and ML are contributing to a fair, equitable, and empowering future. Um, I really want to thank you for attending this webinar. I encourage you to visit these slides online and we'll have a little bit opportunity for interaction uh, related to uh, some of the things I've just introduced uh, later in this section. Thank you uh, for your attention, and I'm going to turn it over to Francis and Lily. Lily, are you here with us? Uh, yeah, Lily's here, but I, I'm sorry, I uh, clicked the wrong button on my computer. Almost no worries. Went away. So sorry, Natalie, uh, somebody just uh, saying it's unbelievable what you are doing uh, and what you are doing with this group and how you're making this group work. And this is really true. Uh, Natalie just joined us as co-chair. She joined as co-chair because we realized that she was doing the work of the chairpersons and we were running away with the glory. Uh, but you can see this is an amazing amount of work she's done. Um, and it's also, let's say, work that really, really needs a lot more support, a lot more help from you. So Natalie has um, put some things, I think her email is out there for everyone, but do connect with her, um, connect with each other as well. Um, I want to go before we before we go to uh, Li Lijiang from Beijing, uh, I just want to go quickly to Louis Ratana. I had lost my overview for a moment there. But Louis is, uh, Louis is a um, incredible thinker in AI. Um, most, he, as I said before, he, he poses the most provocative questions. And within his group, they had been working on looking at uh, informed consent, or consent generally, let's say, and what consent means today with regard to AI. So, Lewis, if you could give us just five minutes or so of your thoughts on consent and how we should threaten, how we should, let's say, place this within the discussion that uh, we're having today and that we've been trying to frame. So, Lewis, please. Um, thank you very much, sir. So, I just have a presentation for that. So, um, let me see. Okay. Screen. Mm -hmm. So, um, does everyone see my screen, my presentation? It's perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. Thank you. Uh, so, um, good day, colleagues. So, I am Luis Jacob Retana. I'm currently the research fellow of the Artificial Intelligence and Data Visitation Working Group. So, I am part of the informed consent team, and we are working on developing guidance on informed consent. Well, in consideration of the impact of artificial intelligence and data visitation. So in building this guidance, um, we first try to examine the growing challenges posed by advancements in AI and data visitation, particularly on the conception, on the conception of practice of informed consent, and specifically on the use and sharing of sensitive information. Then we proceed in rethinking the conception and practice of informed consent in light of these developments and challenges. And then from this reconceptualization, we provided some recommendations for major st stakeholders that we deem crucial in, re in realizing the needed practice of informed consent today. So um, in line with the definition set by the United Nations on sensitive information, 
So our group tried to focus on two pertinent kinds of inform of such information. So first, you, first is psychographic data, which is centered on subjective beliefs, uh, aspiration, and desires of the individual, and genomic data, which is the objective biological constitution of the individual. So, so uh, the growing prevalence of AI systems in daily life drives its increasing need and capability to extract and process sensitive data, particularly the individual psychographic data from his online behavior and his genomic data, either from his biological samples or even via health apps. There are also efforts to synergize both data in order to have a holistic understanding of the person. So this is beneficial in terms of creating diagnosis and even prognosis of the overall health of the individual and also in improving AI-driven services and products. However, such benefits, of course, create risks as they require methods that either sideline, negate, or even prevent the exercise of autonomy, which then makes informed consent impracticable. But what is actually, we want to highlight this one, what is more concerning is that there are already techniques being employed, mostly by big tech companies, to actively subvert and corrupt human autonomy so as to ensure a steady flow of sensitive information. So how do, you, how do they do it? By playing on the desires and weaknesses of the individual. So this is called the business model of attention extraction model. So this, extensively, this is extensively discussed in the Social Dilemma documentary in Netflix, and, uh, uh, which is actually forwarded by the Center for Humane Technology. So uh, we could summarize these challenges into so-called three Bs. So big data analytics, black box problem, and the business model based on attention extraction. So the aim of our deliverable is to have a human-centered guidance, and for that to be the case, it is crucial that informed consent and its underlying principles of human autonomy and dignity are, first, integrated in the interaction between AI systems and its users, so human-computer interaction, so as to facilitate processual and dynamic forms of informed consent, and second, upheld through ensuring transparency and explainability in the design of AI algorithms so as to enable broad and evolving forms of informed consent. And as AI continues to develop, and now with data visitation as a more sophisticated form of AI-driven technique that has the prospect to address challenges of cross-border data exchanges, so extraction and processing of sensitive, sensitive information will become more effective and efficient. Thus, in order to have a conception and practice of informed consent that is sustainable and practicable in an AI-driven world, the individual must be always given a conducive environment to form and reform the exercise of informed consent that he or she deems to be important in protecting his or her autonomy, which in turn will be crucial in rendering today's human technology relationship truly human-centered. Also given so, we provided some recommendations which we think is important in the exercise of the processual and broad informed consent we put forward. Essentially, our recommendations centered on two categories, categories of stakeholders based on two important areas. So first area, uh, so for the first category, vertical category, these are stakeholders that work within the hier hierarchical state-centric environment concerning the issue of global governance. And the second one, the horizontal category, these are stakeholders that work across the international arena on the issue of research and development. So I think relevant to the open science movement, I can highlight our recommend recommendations for the academe. Although feel free to see our recommendations of our paper. I think the most uh, recent version was already posted at our group in the RDA website. So our first recommendation on this area. So work in collaboration with AI and data visitation specialists in order to sufficiently and proactively ensure the explainability of AI systems being used for research. And second, identify the most relevant form of informed consent according to the purposes of the research or experiment and in consideration of varying vulnerabilities of different groups of people. So um, as, way for, as ways forward, we are still trying to examine the implications brought about by data visitation in relation to AI and informed consent. However, with all honesty, due to its nascent and highly technical nature, examining it re uh, remains a challenge. Furthermore, we would like to develop a more concrete recommendations that are more actionable. So we would very much appreciate any comments, suggestions, or contributions on these concerns. So that is all for my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. And me and my team would be happy to get your feedback on our research work on informed consent and AI. 
So just email me at the address in the screen and I will be happy to share our paper. So I will also post my email at the chat. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Lewis. That is fantastic. Um, consent, it's a huge, huge issue. Uh, I think especially with bio data with regard to um, genetics, genomics and so forth, but it's, uh, it's yes, especially here in Europe, it's become such a foundational concept um, uh, as it's applied to data and now to, as it's applied to AI, and it's going to become an extremely complex um, issue here. I'd like to go to Lili Shang. Lili is, um, Dr. Dr. Shang is responsible um, at the China National Information Center, which is part of the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing. It's the place where um, the first internet connection took place in 1984. I believe that's before um, Li Li was born, but nonetheless, uh, she's taking over responsibility there where she runs the International Project Office um, for the Global Open Science Cloud. Um, she really um, undertook the enormous task to try to educate me two weeks ago for two weeks. Um, it was a complete failure. Everybody else got a certificate. I didn't get a certificate of having passed the course. Uh, but if you want to see open science uh, at work, how it's working, it, you really should um, take a look at what the... Um, China National uh, Donation Center, part of the CAS, the Academy of Sciences, and what in particular Li Li is doing with the Global Open Science Cloud here. What we wanted to do is, um, having worked on these different deliverables, let's say, on consent, ethics committees, the Bill of Rights, law, the survey, so forth, within the uh, AIDV working group, we wanted also to try to connect this work to open science. And also within the RDA 10th anniversary um, webinars that were just one of uh, among many that are excellent there, we, uh, this particularly on sustainability, so we wanted to look at that. And Lili is uh, the person to talk to. So Lili, give us your thoughts, please. It's almost midnight, I think, no, it's, past midnight in China. So, oh, it's 11 o'clock. So, Lili, go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Francis. Thank you, everyone. Very glad to join the discussion today and uh, to save you uh, the time. I will uh, report orally uh, briefly about uh, and bring the infrastructure uh, level perspective on the artificial intelligence uh, governance. Uh, I think that the development of uh, open science infrastructures will support the better governance of artificial intelligence a lot. According to the UNESCO recommendation on open science, we see that the open science infrastructures mostly depicts all those facilities, both physically and virtually, that could just, just support us to do open science, to make science open. And, uh, for the uh, local uh, demonstration and the, some of the engagement we have so far, I'm bringing the example of the Global Open Science Cloud Initiative. And uh, the idea was actually uh, uh, dating back to 2019 during the Code Data Conference in Beijing. And uh, the Global Open Science Cloud Initiative is try to co-build a kind of open science environment that we can connect better and trust in the research infrastructures to enable better science discovery. So for the UNESCO recommendation, you see that the highlighted things to develop so many open science cloud, open science infrastructure is to highlight the interconnectivity, the interoperability, accessibility of all different research resources supported by the research facilities. And based on this, we can make a kind of a quick analysis based on the uh, technical framework of such facilities. You see that generally speaking, for the te technical uh, framework of research facilities, we can have like the AAS, infrastructure level services, 
we can have the platform, the PaaS platform uh, as a services. And we also have the SaaS just service, the service itself and the DAS data asset service. And uh, from the infrastructure level perspective, we see that the artificial intelligence, especially for those very big models, the revenue of so many big models will call for GPUs and very good uh, computing facilities. And for the revenue of open science infrastructures from the infrastructure level perspective, the idea is try to bridge different facilities from the computing facilities, from the internet connectivity to get better enhanced. So for the fundamental uh, parts, we see that from the IAS layer, the open science infrastructures are trying to get better interconnected and providing some possibilities to support the running of big models. And we can move on to the PAS layer. And we see that you enter the communication between different platforms, the interoperability between machines are trying to provide the kind of answer. Like when we train the artificial intelligence models, we, we need to uh, do a different uh, uh, things. And uh, based on the interoperability between platforms, we can just uh, train sub-models and uh, jointly have a bigger one. So the interoperability solution supported by open science infrastructures probably will provide the ways we can have even smarter and larger models. Li -Li, and we can have, sorry? I'm very sorry to interrupt you, but um, is it possible to share your screen? Do you want me to uh, share my slide? I'm thinking. It, 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 to save time if it doesn't work well. I um it's up to you. It's entirely up to you. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Actually, yes. I do uh, prepare a slide. But I was trying to just uh, uh report orally. Yeah, I will continue that uh, the report how to support the artificial intelligence running by uh, developing the open science infrastructures, the GeoSC idea, and what we do so far from the technical framework, as I mentioned, from the IAS Federation part, what we do is to provide the robust facilities to support the possibility of uh, having some big models. They call for the GPUs, they call for the computing facilities, they call for a lot of resources that the AIAS are trying to provide. And based on that, the communication between platforms such as the federated learning and a lot of other things um, are uh, better trained the models into uh, uh, a wise way. Uh, to uh, guide our uh, uh, daily life and have better uh, deployment. And uh, based on that, for uh, the running of uh, models, we have the facility supports, we have better algorithm uh, to running. And uh, the most important is we need data. Sometimes we, we, we see that uh, some of the uh, AI models, we have uh, data bias, so why? It's because the later lack of particularly uh, kind of data sets it might be uh, focused on a particular region, a particular domain, so it can predict things with very with some limitations. So to offset the data bias problem problems, the federation between data uh, different uh, uh, data sets, the service deliveries can just provide the a kind of uh, different perspective that will make a bigger, wiser models better to guide our uh, work. So based on this, we see that the revenue of such open science facilities from different layers, they are trying to provide the, some po potential possibilities to support better artificial intelligence uh, governing. And uh, on the whole, we see that for these open science infrastructures, what they really do is a kind of ecosystem for all. For these open science infrastructures, comparing to uh, uh, our existing ones, 
the emphasis of it is trying to make things open and to make things inclusive. So the first thing and the most important thing it do is to uh, create a kind of ecosystem that every stakeholder can have their voice in. And that will provide a computer, a kind of stakeholder uh, view, very important uh, for the uh, uh, artificial intelligence model developing. And uh, needless to say, the uh, uh, facilities they provide, the technical, the algorithm things they are developing are trying to guarantee the fundamental running basis that could really support efficient uh, models exploration. And as, um, as I mentioned, the ecosystem part will provide a diversified and uh, harmonized perspective that could really boost the AI deployment and exploration from and to domains and regions. And besides, based on all these practices, the open science infrastructures are trying to do, like for capacity building for enhanced data literacy, and uh, to raise awareness of how to get engaged and behave better and uh, soundly within uh, such uh, artificial intelligence models can just uh, help us to gather together for a responsible open science. So, uh, and the last but also very important thing is we see a lot of uh, uh, reports on the, um, how to say, the frontiers the artificial intelligence are bringing. And on the other hand, we also see a lot of challenging part because of for so many resources running before it reach a kind of business model. So for federated uh, uh, open science infrastructures, the key ideas, the interconnectivity, the interoperability will all let us to try more ways to save energy based on existing facilities. So within limited budget, we are trying to do better research, larger scale of research, and it will surely work also uh, within our uh, uh, AI models driving way. So I think the business models we are trying to have uh, within the open science cloud can also be shared when they try to drive the AI uh, models running. And uh, on a whole, so for the open science cloud development, what are the priorities? I think there probably will be a three things as we mentioned. The first and uh, the overall thing is try to uh, uh, establish a kind of open research environment and such environment will be driven by some cutting edge uh, technologies. So the artificial intelligence will have their very important role in driving those development of future-led open science infrastructures. And based on this, the open science infrastructures will highlight a lot on the on-demand demand, uh, interoperability of uh, cloud service delivery. And uh, the artificial intelligence models, as uh, mentioned uh, recently, the Meta companies trying to have uh, very big and shared models for their uh, uh, AI models. And that will be a collaborative and a very good example of sharing how the AI models are trying to collaborate. The running, the operation, operationing and also the sharing, the deployment. So it will save both the data and a lot of facilities resources, but it could be deployed in domains and regions and it could just be beneficial to a lot of stakeholders. And besides, uh, pay great attention to the policy study. It, the, uh, the typical principles we have so far, the fair, the care, the trust are all very good and very uh, powerful things. We should always remem remembering when we are trying to develop the uh, governance rules in the running of the uh, AI uh, models. And uh, nevertheless to say, we need to develop a kind of uh, open and a fair matrix and the incentives to let stakeholders to really get engaged in the running of this uh, AI governance. And so it can be ensured 
it, it is the demonstration for open science and uh, it will be sustained for our future development. And the, back to uh, our GEOSC initiative, I think um, Francis has been uh, reminding our uh, team for uh, very good issues on how to bear in mind that when we develop, co-develop the kind of open science uh, cloud, uh, we need to think more about how we can uh, get in a better support uh, the AI governance. I think there are a few things we could do to make sure that responsible open science model can be running through the facilities in support of trust uh, worthy facility itself and also better uh, guide the governance of artificial intelligence. From the policy perspective, the trust ecosystem uh, construction, the better understanding about the different levels of openness of uh, resources and uh, clear boundaries between different resor resources. So we know how we just uh, carry out our policies on sensitive data and how we can just uh, make a full use of different research resources and help them support running of AI models, both from the facility part, but also from the resources part that can just uh, help to increase the performance of uh, the artificial intelligence models. And uh, the second part is about the governance part. It should be resources saving because we all, we have so many examples that the, the AI models are running a lot and uh, they just need a lot of uh, money to uh, establish a kind of high performance to, um, computing centers to do a lot of things. So we need to discover some kind of sustained, both sustained and effective ways that uh, it will nourish the larger models running based on the shared facilities, both for the things you do, but also beneficial to others for open science research. And for the technical part at this time, we can have something uh, very uh, on hand to do. The first probably it will be the secured uh, authentication and authorization infrastructures. So different people, different resources are uh, kind of uh, interconnected uh, between we are carrying on our things. So it's the first level for trust, uh, uh, trust worthy things we are trying to do. And the second part is trying to uh, fulfill every idea so through your GeoSA test bed. So when you do the design and development of such open science cloud, think about the strategies. You should just uh, get involved of different stakeholders and let their voice in and uh, to make sure that when you're running any AI models through your platforms, you can just uh, identify the key uh, issues and also uh, avoid the, the things of bias for data and the limitations of uh, resources and make it better that way. So that is almost all, Some just some preliminary ideas. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Zhang, uh, Li Li, thank you so much. I, I think this is really almost the perfect way to, to end this. I believe that DJ Whitford is not able to join us. He was with us in the beginning, but I believe that um, he's had to drop off because I got so behind with time. But um, I am still here, but if you're behind on time, Francis, that's okay, we can skip. No, 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 CJ, CJ, I, I, I was looking for you. I couldn't find you. So glad you're here. Okay, good. Um, please tell us something about Gork and tell us, because I think what you're doing complements so well with what Lili is doing and this overstructure. So please um, give us some insight into what you're doing with the Global Open Science uh, Research Commons. Muted. Realizing that we are short on time, I just wanted to throw some links into the chat. Um, so. Uh, yeah, the Global Open Research Commons International Model Working Group is complementary to the Global Open Science Cloud <laughs> uh, group that Lili just presented on behalf of. Um, and so I should introduce myself a little bit. I'm CJ. Um, I'm one of the co-chairs for this RDA group. It's a working group within our interest group. Um, 
And the way that we, and what we've done, what you'll see in the chat as well, is we've created a model, a non-prescriptive model that's intended to be used as a guide for how you could build or expand on your commons um, as a open research commons with the goal of getting towards something like a global open science cloud or a global open research commons, um, whichever terms that you prefer to use, I think they're pretty synonymous. Um, and so thinking about it from the point of AI, the model that we've created is not specific to artificial intelligence or machine learning. Uh, we've created a model for general considerations that are non-prescriptive. And I think that you can actually take lenses onto this model and artificial intelligence and how you deal with it and how you work with it is one of those. Um, so I'm gonna be talking a little bit from the perspective of um, when you have artificial intelligence applied to your commons externally. So things kind of like cybersecurity, uh, and then how do you also deal with it when it's from internal? So how do you do training, promoting it on your platforms, users who want to build artificial intelligence with you, or you want to incorporate that into your services and tools? Uh, you could look at it in different ways, of course, there too. You could have bad actors with artificial intelligence. So I don't know, people trying to steal your data, something like that. And then you could also have good actors um, to promote open science, which is kind of where we've been leading in these discussions so far. And I think probably where we want to keep it. Um, so the model is built on the essential elements that were identified or defined by our um, Global Open Research Commons interest group with RDA. And what we mean by a commons, just to be clear, it is very similar to a, uh, the, the Global Open Science Cloud idea, where it's a global um, trusted ecosystem that provides seamless access to high quality interoperable research outputs and services. Um, and so our model is organized based on these essential elements. It dives into much more granularity than the elements you see here. But in total, you can kind of think of these elements as breaking things down into governance and policy, and also breaking things down into infrastructure and technology. Um, so things that are kind of human centric are in that white, or in those white hexagons. I'm not going to read them all out. And uh, broken into also infrastructure and technology. So like the hardware stuff that you need to deal with. Um, on those light blue ones. And everything's held together, of course, by interoperability and standards in the center. So in the development of this model, which is now out for an official RDA request for comment, so I encourage everyone to go check out that second link. It's also embedded in the slides in multiple areas. Um, the model came from a pretty extensive research, uh, sorry, a literature review or a landscape review of over 150 resources, both from RDA and the digital research infrastructure community on the whole. Um, we heard from 12 representatives of commons throughout the globe, literally in every continent, I believe. Uh, and that kind of informed our model. And so um, the model is currently in a spreadsheet format with categories and subcategories of the essential elements with um, attributes and features or characteristics rather applied on top of them. And you can apply different lenses to that. So you can think of it in terms of um, in this case, artificial intelligence, but we're also looking to do more things with the model afterwards. So how do you say apply them to medical uh, contexts and biodata? And this model didn't isn't just there. <laughs> There's been a lot of work. So this our working group has been around for several years, and I've been working full time with the with the working group for the past year. Um, so one full time person and sixty nine folks who do it off the side of their desk. So it's quite a quite a big effort. Um, it's gone through four plenary sessions, a workshop, 26 meetings, 69 members in total in our working group, and uh, refined down to about 15 to 18 people that were dedicated on it um, over the course of the last year in six task groups. All right, so back to this kind of looking at this essential elements, things that you can actually take away and it's a little more actionable um, than just me talking at you. <laughs> So thinking about artificial intelligence governance some things that you can take from or how you can apply artificial intelligence as a lens on our model, which again is open for you to view. Um, I created a tiny URL there up in the corner, but it's also in the chat if you want to click it and in the slides um, if you have access, if you are opening the slides. But things you can actually consider uh, when you're thinking about bringing artificial intelligence or considering artificial intelligence in terms of your commons. Uh, and it doesn't have to be commons. I think this could actually apply in other in other situations too, like repositories. Um, some things will just be more relevant and less relevant depending on your specific context. So for governance and leadership, um, which is again, these human structures that we're talking about, you can think about how does AI externally or internally to your commons affect and interact with your mission, your vision and your values? How does it affect or interact with your strategy? Um, how does it affect your funding and resourcing, your participation in policy uh, development elsewhere? 
how does it get incorporated, especially into your risk management framework or frameworks? And is there a management or governance body that's going to actually tackle or take care of artificial intelligence um, considerations and, and everything that comes uh, with those? What do you need to include in your internal policies? What, what is important in terms of legal and ethical compliance? And what does that look like for you? Um, and then what frameworks are you trying to incorporate in your comments, like fair care and trust, as Lili has already mentioned, and how does artificial intelligence kind of work with or against them in certain situations? You might also think about other frameworks that you want to include, like the Sendai framework. Um, it's going to affect the rules of participation and access. So how does artificial intelligence interact with your commons or the holdings of your commons? Uh, thinking about your access policy, your reuse policy, privacy policies, attribution policies, etc. What does an acceptable use for artificial intelligence look like within your commons or, in, or uh, inter interconnected with it? And then does that also impact your code of conduct or should it? Uh, sustainability, Ugh. sorry, how does, uh, so this is kind of something that as I was uh, thinking about it might make sense for you to consider at the end of your considerations on AI governance because sustainability loops back to, do you have the human resources, the information resources or the knowledge resources and the financial resources kind of linking back again to Lily as she talked about um, a business continuity plan. Um, how does everything to do with artificial intelligence link back to that sustainability piece? Um, how are you going to fund things? How are you going to allocate things? That's important. How does artificial intelligence impact engagement with your stakeholders? So that's um, both internal to your commons and then external to your commons. What does that look like in terms of your members, your providers, your users? Um, how does that look in terms of engagement with other research infrastructures? So again, building towards a global open research commons or a global open science cloud, uh, you need to interact with others and have shared infrastructure, federated infrastructure in some cases. Depending on what your policy or stance on artificial intelligence look like, is that promote or inhibit? And how can you come to a mutual understanding? All that's gonna be part of engagement. For human capacity, um, do you have the staff like the actual per the actual people or the person hours uh, to do what you want with artificial intelligence and cybersecurity and the various aspects that goes along with that. Um, do you need to do case studies and use cuts and use and use cases to see how this is going to play out? Do you have a way of managing internal knowledge about all these things that you're doing with artificial intelligence and policy? Um, and do you have a way of preserving that long term for when you have staff turnover or you want, or you need to build your team? And of course, as Art has already been mentioned multiple times, are you offering training? on pertinent aspects of artificial intelligence, not just for your commons community, like your users, um, but also for your own internal staff. They need to know what's going on too. And so thinking about training and education in that aspect is, is really key. I won't cover the rest of these, um, just highlighting that interoperability and standards and conventions are going to be key no matter what you do with the commons. And there's a whole other consideration, which Lily also mentioned briefly around the infrastructure part, which are these bottom three of um, ICT infrastructure, services and tools, and then the research objects themselves. But uh, given our time, I just want to say uh, thanks for listening. Please have a look at our model. It is open for um, for comments until October 20th. And also feel free to uh, send me an email if you've got specific questions. Thanks. Oh, CJ, I was really feeling sorry for you when I was watching your presentation because I think you thought, oh, we've done, we've covered everything about the kind commons, open clouds. Um, we, we did all the characteristics of it. It was all done. And now these people come along, they throw a AI on top of it. And we have to go back and rethink the whole thing. So I, I apologize, but I think that's what I understood you to be suggesting too. We really have to understand the characteristics of this and look again. I want to suggest to everyone to really go to the um, global open um open science the work um uh, working group cj throw the link again in in the chat to see what they're doing look at their outputs they're amazing their outputs um look at the the interviews not the interviews but the webinars that they've had with all these people that cj lined up to look at all these different open science platforms around the world they're fantastic what he's done there it's really good. Um, the only thing I can think about this webinar is we're going to have to do it again and try to get it right this time somehow. Um, my apologies to uh, Natalie and um, 
Alif for messing it up so much. But uh, Alif, um, maybe you first, and Natalie, you two can close this thing if it's possible. And uh, we'll, we will get people the recording. We will get them the slides. Uh, we will get them the chat. And we apologize for me talking so much. Alif. Okay, um, I've already um, talked too much, so I'm just uh, finished with thanking all everyone who participated here today and also um, everyone who presented. Uh, I'm really very happy to be a part of this group and, I'm, uh, and I would like to thank each and every one of you for being here and I hope to collaborate uh, more. I have noted all the emails sent to me um, from chat or from email. Uh, and we're going to, going to con uh, connect with you next week to have a meeting to discuss the um, specifics of how we can run the survey in a, in a broader sense. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Natalie, and everyone who participated. Thank you, I love. Thanks everyone for coming today. You'll see in the bottom of the chat a link to the RDA, Artificial Intelligence and Data Visitation Working Group webpage, where there is a file repository containing slides from today's talks. We'll also be posting a link to the video there on that website. And um, I'd like to invite you all to continue to share your thoughts and ideas with the working group over on the AHA site. We got a great, a lot of great brainstorm ideas. Um, thanks for turning out today. And um, Let's uh, work together to create a terrific environment for um, AI and open science infrastructure. Thank you, Francis, for hosting us all. Francis, you're muted. No, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's been great. Uh, I, we lost a lot of people in the beginning because we had a limit that we didn't see. So we have to go back and get caught up. But uh, Alif and um, Natalie, and, and I think everyone, I think we got to find a way to do this again, do it better, um, but also get more room for people to talk. There's too many people here uh, who have been really patient listening and so forth, but these are things that we need to talk about. So we have to find a way to do that. Everybody's welcome to join the working group, of course. And we will get um, slides to you and, and the things like that there too. Okay, I'll close the meeting then and, and thank everyone. Bye-bye for now. Yeah.